Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Mike, for the, the introduction. Um, so yeah, uh, I have the pleasure of giving you guys a brief tutorial for Jeff's talk on black holes and quantum computers. Um, and I want to start uh, with just some very broad motivations before I tell you what I'll, I'll be um, giving a tutorial on for the next 20 minutes or so. Um, so uh, as, as you might have seen by the title of the talk, um, we're going to, Jeff is going to be talking about sort of the intersection of quantum mechanics on one hand and quantum gravity on the other. Uh, as probably all of you are familiar with, these two are notoriously difficult to reconcile with one another. Um, and, you know, in the past few decades, nonetheless, a tremendous amount of progress has been made in this direction, stemming um, from what's known as the ADS CFT duality. And so, what this is, is um, a duality that exactly maps certain quantum gravity theories um, to uh, certain quantum mechanical systems. And you can sort of immediately see why, why this duality would be tremendously powerful if we are trying to learn about quantum gravity, because we have these quantum gravity theories that maybe we don't fully understand all the details of on the one hand, and somehow these theories are exactly mappable to quantum mechanical systems which you know, may be hard to solve, but in principle, we know how quantum mechanics works. And one thing which I'll hopefully convince you of in this tutorial is that this duality really highlights the importance of quantum information for understanding quantum gravity. So with that said, uh, the goal of this tutorial is just to give a very high level overview of the ADS-CFT duality. Uh, obviously, this is a very rich subject, so I'm just going to sort of cover the overall phenomenology of this duality. Um, and in particular, I want to cover two aspects of this phenomenology. Um, on the one hand, I want to discuss how entanglement in our theory of quantum mechanics uh, has some connections to geometry in these theories of quantum gravity. And second, I want to discuss uh, connections um, in the, within this duality to the physics of black holes in particular in, in these theories of gravity. And so this tutorial will be very brief, but if anyone's curious as, and has an extra 10 or 15 minutes on their hands, I highly recommend this uh, perspective article by Xiaoling Qi in Nature Physics a few years ago, um, which I've listed below. And so uh, what is this duality specifically? Um, so this is a duality between, on the one hand, quantum mechanical theories in d plus one dimensions. So that's d space dimensions and one time dimension. And on the other hand, theories of quantum gravity in one higher dimension. So d plus one space dimensions and one time dimension. And intuitively, and I'll get to this more in a few slides, um, one thinks about this quantum mechanical theory as living on the boundary of the gravitational space-time. So this extra space dimension in the gravity theory is some direction that moves into the bulk of this space-time. But I'll, I'll make this more precise in a few slides. And now I should say that this duality doesn't apply for any quantum mechanical theory or any gravitational theory. Uh, there are some caveats in it which are implied in the name. So in particular, we're considering some quantum mechanical system at low temperature and we imagine that at that low temperature, this quantum mechanical system is governed by some conformal field theory description. And in particular, that that conformal field theory description has what is called a large end limit. So, uh, you know, it's important to note that this doesn't apply to any quantum mechanical theory necessarily. Um, but for a lot of what we talk about, these details are not so important. And we can really think of this as just some strongly interacting quantum mechanical system in the given dimension. On the other side, there's also some caveats. This applies to what's called anti-de-sitter or ADS space, which is some condition on the curvature of space-time. Again, it won't be too important for the details of this talk. So uh, with that being said, I'd like to highlight for, for this audience in particular, um, one very well-known example of this duality. And this is known as the Sachdevier-Kataev or SYK model. 
So this model is in, in fact, I think one of the very few instances we have of a concrete microscopic model uh, that you know, we know this duality holds exactly for. And so the SYK model is defined in terms of what are called Majorana fermions. This is some particular uh, type of degree of freedom. And um, in particular, we, have, we imagine we have some large number of these degrees of freedom, a lot of different fermions. And these fermions interact with each other via some four body interaction. And the coefficients of these interactions are random. And an important part of this is that every Majorana fermion interacts with every other fermion. So there's no real sense of spatial locality in the system. And so we call this a zero D system. There, there's no spatial dimension. And so of course there, there is one time dimension. So we call this a zero plus one dimensional quantum system. And it turns out that at low temperatures, the SYK model is governed by some conformal field theory description. And in fact, the entire physics of this model at low temperatures is known to be exactly dual to a theory of gravity in one space and one time dimension. And so uh, I've, I've drawn sort of a, a depiction of this on the right side. The important aspects to get out of this are really uh, that this quantum mechanical theory is 0D. So it's really just a single point, which then extends to a line when I include the time direction. That's this vertical line, say, on the left side. And the gravity theory has one additional dimension, which is this horizontal space dimension. Those are the only details I really want you to get out of this uh, plot for the moment. And so what does dual mean in this context? Uh, so the strong, it, it's in fact quite a strong statement. Um, the Hilbert space of the quantum mechanical theory is precisely equal to the Hilbert space of the quantum gravity theory. And so in particular, the quantum gravity Hilbert space includes uh, you know, states that are, you know, contain different space-time geometries. And now, of course, if the Hilbert spaces are equal, in principle, we can also map operators from one theory to operators in the other. Uh, this correspondence is simplest to state for op operators on the boundary. So if we consider some local operator in my quantum mechanical theory, this in fact maps to a local operator at the boundary of this higher dimensional uh, gravity theory. And so this is precisely the sense in which I think of the quantum mechanical theory, this purple line, as living at the boundary of the quantum gravity theory, this blue bulk. Now in principle, because this is a duality, I can also map operators in the bulk of my gravity theory into the boundary, my quantum mechanical theory. Um, and in some instances, it's known how to do this, but in general, this is a much more subtle and much more difficult and, of course, much more interesting uh, focus of research. Um, okay, and so, you know, I've discussed how we can map states between states and operators between operators. Um, there's also some more surprising connections uh, in this duality. And in particular, I want to highlight the connections between entanglement in my quantum theory and geometry in my gravitational theory. So if I take some subregion, call it A, of my quantum theory, uh, I can define the state of my CFT within that subspace by just taking the total state of my CFT, some density matrix, rho CFT, and tracing out the rest of the system. Uh, this gives me some density matrix rho A on my subspace A. And one can ask, what is the entropy of subsystem A? So what is the von Neumann entropy of this density matrix rho A? Well, it turns out um, that this can be derived exactly, um, or this is given exactly by properties of the space-time geometry within my gravity theory. So in particular, um, it's equal, the entanglement entropy is equal to the area of a minimal surface through the bulk of my gravity theory. So uh, to be precise, uh, I'll take some a uh, line segment with um, endpoints at the endpoints of A. And now I allow this line to go into the bulk of my gravity theory. And I define the area of this as the length of the line. In higher dimensions, this would be an area. I minimize this curve over all possible areas. And I get that the entropy of A is actually given precisely by the length or area of this curve extending through the gravitational bulk. 
So this highlights, you know, just a really surprising connection between entanglement in the quantum theory and the geometry of this gravity theory. And so, you know, this sort of concludes the broad um, phenomenological aspects of this mapping. And now I want to describe in a bit more detail what the specific... Can I ask Sorry. a question? Can I interject a pedantic question, Tommy? Yes, please. So, so why isn't it just a straight line? Like if it was the minimal surface, I think I'd just draw a straight line. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's, uh, so this is a geodesic. It's in some sense a straight line. The point is that my space time is curved. And so, you know, lines that are the shortest distance don't always look straight when I draw them, say in like this Euclidean looking picture. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mike. Um, okay. And so, yeah, I, I'm sorry, you know, this is necessarily sort of a lot of, of things to cover that I can't go over in, in full detail. Um, but so, so I, what I want to talk about with the, the last couple slides is really about what this particular um, space-time geometry in the bulk looks like for typical CFT states of interest. And so, uh, you know, one aspect of gravity that we're all familiar with, and which is, you know, particularly fascinating, are the existence of black holes. So black holes are solutions to Einstein's theory of general relativity. And they're described, uh, or they feature in particular, what's known as an event horizon and a singularity. And the idea is that if I have some particle outside the black hole and it's moving um, you know, across space-time, once it crosses the event horizon into the black hole, it can never escape. Even if it can travel at the speed of light, it can never escape the black hole. And now, uh, eventually, in fact, this particle in some finite time will hit the singularity of the black hole, at which point the curvature of space diverges and Einstein's equations break down. And so when asked, you know, purely out of curiosity, for instance, uh, are there any CFT states that this black hole in the bulk corresponds to? And the answer, in fact, is yes. And in fact, it's, you know, most cases we care about. Um, so in particular, if I consider quantum mechanics at some finite temperature in my boundary theory, so say some density matrix e to the minus h over t, or beta is 1 over t, um, one can show via certain entropic arguments that this corresponds to a black hole of the same temperature t in the bulk of my space-time theory. And yeah, so, so in fact, you know, the physics of these finite temperature CFT systems are intimately connected to the physics of black holes. Um, now, okay. th there's lots of rich, uh, you know, physics to be discussed here, and I'm going to leave most of that to Jeff during his talk. And for now, I just want to jump forward to maybe an even more bizarre and interesting uh, gravitational geometry and what this draw geometry corresponds to in the quantum mechanical picture. Um, so so this, this new geometry is not a black hole, but a wormhole. Um, so a wormhole is a space-time connection between two distant regions of space-time. So I'm gonna call one region the left and one the right. I've shown that here. And from the perspective of either the left or the right sides, uh, a wormhole looks just like an ordinary black hole. I can jump into it and I can never come out. Now it turns out, um, you know, you again, this is some solution to Einstein's uh, equations of general relativity that, uh, you know, I, an observer from either side can jump in and never get out, but those observers can nevertheless meet in the middle. That is the st statement that these regions of space time are connected. So someone jumping in from the left can meet someone jumping in from the right in the middle. Um, so now we can ask what this corresponds to in the dual quantum mechanical theory on the boundary. And in fact, uh, the answer is, is quite cool and surprising, and it ties back to this previous theme connecting entanglement in quantum mechanics to geometry in the gravitational picture. Um, so this wormhole geometry is dual to essentially a lot of EPR pairs between my left system and my right system. 
So an EPR pair, I think we're mostly familiar with, is a state of two qubits where, uh, say, either qubit can be either up or down, but the two qubits are always fixed to be the same state. So they have one qubit of entanglement between them. And I'm imagining I take sort of the left qubit of the EPR pair and put it on the left and the right on the right. And then I take a lot, a lot of different EPR pairs. So I have a lot of left qubits and a lot of right qubits. And I consider those as two subsystems, the lefts and the rights. And these two subsystems are highly entangled from all these EPR pairs. And um, so, so my claim is that this uh, state in my quantum mechanical system is dual to this wormhole in the gravitational theory. And to be more precise, um, you know, discussing this as EPR's pairs was sort of an intuitive argument. And um, more precisely, one considers what's known as the thermal field double state, which is in essence just EPR pairs, but only within this low energy subspace in which my CFT is dual to the wormhole. And so uh, finally, I would just like to introduce some diagrammatic notation that is uh, quite convenient for discussing this process of particles traveling through the wormhole um, in a prelude to Jeff's talk. And these are known as Penrose diagrams. And I, in fact, showed you one earlier um, just as a sort of toy picture. So in these diagrams, I, I'm going to sort of collapse one of these spatial directions. So I'm only going to keep one space direction. That's this horizontal axis. And then I'm also going to add in now a time direction moving upwards. And so now my entire left uh, quantum mechanical theory, this circle on the left side, is mapped to a single point on this time axis. And then, of course, uh, I have some time axis, this system at different times. And again, the right system is collapsed to a point here, which then also broadens to a vertical line when I include the time direction. And now, uh, you know, each black hole features some event horizon. So I've drawn these as dotted lines here. And in this Penrose diagram, these are, again, dotted lines. Uh, don't worry too much about um, the, these past dotted lines. Um, and yeah, so these dotted lines are the horizon. And finally, at the sort of bottom of this black hole, in, in, in some vague sense, there's a singularity. And I've drawn that as this jagged line at the top of the diagram. And so what happens if some observer, say Alice, jumps in to the left black hole is, you know, she falls past the event horizon into the black hole and eventually at some point meets a singularity. And in this diagram, I'll draw that as just, you know, she starts in the left quantum mechanical system at some time and she travels uh, according to what I've drawn as a 45 degree line. So this would be at the speed of light. I'm setting the speed of light to be a 45 degree line in this case. Um, into the black hole. And so once she's past the event horizon, she can never escape. And no matter you know, whether she turns around or keeps on heading straight, she'll always eventually hit the singularity. But now, because this is a wormhole, we can also consider some other observer, Bob, jumping in from the right side of the black hole. Um, he too passes his own event horizon. Uh, this is this right dotted line. And eventually also hits the singularity. However, uh, as we mentioned, um, because this is a wormhole, Alice and Bob can in fact meet while they're both in the black hole. And um, you know they can talk to each other, exchange plans, exchange information, um, and then eventually they, they will both hit the singularity. And so you know, I just wanted to put this diagram up and sort of discuss this process in more detail. Um, and finally, just to conclude, I want to remark on how remarkable it is that uh, this is in fact the description of our original quantum mechanical system. Because if you recall, our original quantum mechanical system was just a bunch of entangled qubits between the left and right hand sides. And then the subsequent evolution of each side is governed by just two disconnected Hamiltonians, the CFT Hamiltonian on each side. And so it's quite surprising that these two systems that are disconnected besides their initial shared entanglement, feature some geometrical description um, in a connected geometry in space-time. And so understanding the physics of this connection of you know, Alice and Bob meeting in here and how information in the black hole is sort of recovered in the dual CFD description 
is you know a very interesting topic of research and i think uh, some aspects of this will be discussed uh, with more detail and much more insight in jeff's talk and so uh, with that being said uh, hopefully i've given you a, a brief introduction to ads cft and i'd now like to introduce our main speaker jeff pennington so jeff did his bachelor's and master's at cambridge university he then uh, came over to Stanford University, where he did his PhD, working with Patrick Hayden, among others. Uh, since 2020, we've been lucky to have him as an assistant professor at UC Berkeley. And uh, in 2021, he was awarded uh, the New Horizons in Physics Breakthrough Prize for calculating the quantum information content of a black hole and its radiation. So I, I think he'll um, you know, tell us a little bit about this research, maybe a lot about this research in his upcoming talk, along with many other uh, thoughts. And so, yeah, uh, without further ado, uh, Jeff, you can go ahead with your talk. Thanks, Tommy. Beautiful job. Okay. Sorry about that. I, I was still muted. Thank you very much, Tommy, for for wonderful introduction. You're doing a great job uh, setting the stage for this talk. Okay, let me start my slideshow. Awesome. Um, so yeah, this this talk is called Black Holes and Quantum Computers, um, and I, I want to you know give you give you a sense of of why those two things are connected. Some of the exciting things we've learned about black holes from from thinking about quantum computers and, and more down to earth quantum mechanical stuff uh, over the last, last decade or two. Um, but I thought I'd start with something, something even more down to earth than a, a quantum computer, and that's an egg. And we're gonna take this egg and we're gonna drop it and we're gonna let it smash everywhere as, as tends to happen when you drop an egg. Um, and then at a certain point, we're gonna stop time. Okay, we're going to pause everything, freeze everything in place, uh, and just have our, our splattering of our egg frozen. And then we're going to start manipulating things. Specifically, we're going to take every particle of this egg, we're going to reverse its velocity. Maybe to be safe, we're also going to turn all the electrons into positrons and so on, and, and mirror image the entire universe, but we'll, we'll, we'll not worry about that part too much. Um, and then we're going to start time going forwards again. So what's going to happen? Well, the answer, if you, you were able to do this experiment, which you obviously can't, would be something like this. The egg would sort of splatter back together, all the, the velocities would reverse, so it's coming together. Everything would hit into a lump, would reform into a solid object, and all the momentum would make it pop up into the air spontaneously. So the reason for this is, of course, that the laws of physics, Schrodinger's equation essentially is reversible, right? Some, some unitary evolution going forwards, and if you complex conjugate your state psi, which is, is basically what you did, uh, then that forwards evolution becomes backwards evolution and time just, just sort of naturally starts, starts running backwards. Okay, so this is, is sort of you know, fairly, fairly standard stuff in physics. That's just a very basic fact about, about how you know, ordinary world laws of physics works, both classical and quantum. Um, but in 1975, Hawking claimed something very weird. He claimed that evaporating black holes, black holes that are allowed to just sit in, in empty space and, and let, them, let themselves radiate like sort of a lump of hot coal or something, are very different. Claimed that, that black, such a black hole would eventually completely evaporate into what's called Hawking radiation. But that Hawking radiation would just be in a random thermal state that had nothing to do with the initial state of the matter that, say, we fell into. Okay, so this is completely, completely different to ordinary unitary time evolution in quantum mechanics. It's some sort of fundamentally stochastic process. Um, so the, the claim that this was true sparked what's called the black hole information problem, been a major topic in, in theoretical physics ever since. Um, and pretty much since the moment Stephen Hawking made this claim, then a lot of people immediately became Became very unhappy. Uh, Lenny Siskind, famously very early on, was, was fighting on strongly against this. Gerald de Tuft was also, you know, one of the early people who didn't believe this could possibly be true. Quantum mechanics has to has to work the way we think. Uh, and gradually, over the next forty five years or so, we've got increasing evidence that Hawking was wrong. In particular, the the stuff talk, Tommy was talking about the discovery of ADS CFT 
can be thought of as a sort of indirect proof that information fundamentally cannot be lost. Okay, because on the, the CFT side of the duality, we just have ordinary quantum mechanics, and we know ordinary quantum mechanics follows the Schrodinger's equation, it's unitary, no information is lost. Uh, and hence also presumably on the ADS side, information can't be lost. But what we didn't have for a long time, you know, that's sort of satisfying at some level, but it's also not telling you like why Hawking's calculation that he claimed shows information was lost is, is actually wrong. We made a lot of progress since then. And sort of in the modern view, we've really reached the point where we think that the quantum black holes are just ordinary quantum mechanical systems. In particular, they're, they're strongly coupled, uh, very chaotic, uh, isolated quantum systems that are just evolving unitarily according to the Schrodinger equation. Essentially, you can think of them from a quantum information point of view as just some, some very, very large quantum computer like running some very complicated quantum algorithm, running, running this, this complicated, strongly coupled and we've increasingly found evidence that supports this view, increasingly found, found specific gravitational calculations involving black holes that say, yes, that this is actually what happened. In particular, in 2019, there was a load of work that, that I, was, I was very involved with, where we finally found the, the sort of first gravitational calculations that explicitly showed Hawking's original calculation being wrong, showing that actually information does escape the black hole and the Hawking radiation, the, Haw Hawking, the, you know, the, the, the matrix mapping your, your initial state of, of infalling matter into the black holes, the final state of the Hawking radiation is just some, some unitary matrix, just like any other, any other time resolution. We now know at a fundamental level sort of what Hawking missed, where he was making mistakes and so on. Um, so my, my aim for this talk is gonna you know, give, you, give you the mode view of this whole history, starting with Hawking's original arguments, and then the, the sort of counter arguments of, of how people thought things should work, and then the, the increasing amount of actual evidence we've had that, that is indeed how black holes should work. Um, and I'm going to focus primarily on the, the stuff I was involved with in 2019 because it's, it's the stuff I know best. And, and in many ways, it's particularly exciting because it's fundamentally showing how Hawking was wrong. But there's a lot of other interesting developments that show other ways in which, which black holes are just like a, a you know, strongly coupled, isolated quantum mechanical system like, like some complicated quantum computer. Um, so that's, that's the aim for the talk. Um, but let me start by just sort of, you know, reviewing what, what Hawking was thinking, because he was a smart guy and he, he had good reason to think that maybe possibly we should be willing to throw unitary quantum mechanics out the window and accept that information is actually lost. Okay, so let's start with the black hole. Um, so Tommy did an excellent job of, of introducing Penrose diagrams, which are the, these, these diagrams that we use to describe black holes. But just to reiterate, because it's important, and I know a lot of people may not be familiar with them, um, what we've done here is we've just dropped all our angular directions because the space-time is, is spherically symmetrical, so they don't tell us anything interesting. So that means we have two dimensions left. We have time that goes up and sort of radial direction in space the increasing radius goes out to the right. Okay. Um, and then, you know, obviously the space time of the black hole is curved. I can't represent it properly on a sheet of paper. So I've just sort of ignored distances. Distances are not at all to scale, except for the fact that I'm insisting that light rays travel at 45 degrees. Okay. That's the, the only sense in which, which I'm, I'm, I'm respecting the actual geometry of the space time. Everything else is not to scale. So for example, these lines out here actually represent infinite radius, infinitely far away from the black hole. So there's another point on the space time that's very important. That's this singularity, center of the black hole. Again, Tommy talked about it a bit. And this is where all the laws of physics that we know break down. We have no idea how to deal with it. You know, presumably something from like string theory or whatever the theory of everything is, will we'll make it all work out, but we, we don't know how how that works. Okay, so I said here be dragons. That's a dragon from, from Game of Thrones. Um, but don't worry, it's from one of the, the good seasons of Game of Thrones. Um, and nothing in this talk is really going to shed anything like on any light on, on what happens at this singularity. Um, but there's this one other, you know, the, the, that's just completely beyond what we know how to talk about. And there's one other, other point that is super important in, in the description of the black hole and sort of defines the actual edge of the black hole. And that's this horizon. So this is a, a line going 45 degrees to the right. Um, 
And it represents the last point at which you're able to escape the black hole if you travel outwards at the speed of light and make it out to infinite radius. If you're slightly too late and you're here, even if you travel at the speed of light, you'll still end up getting sucked into the black hole's singularity. There's just, just no way to avoid it. Okay. And importantly, for a big enough black hole, at the horizon, then there's, there's nothing too crazy going on, at least locally. Like if you, you fall into some superblasted black hole, you probably won't even notice that you're passing the horizon. Everything will seem, seem pretty normal. So our classical space-time descriptions are, are, are sort of ordinary quantum field theory and stuff like that should be, should be trustworthy. Okay. It turns out this is all you need to, to do basically all the calculations I'm going to be talking about today is this physics of stuff near and just inside and just outside the horizon. Okay, so in particular, we're going to study our fields near this horizon. So, so our space time has a lot of fields. There's electric fields, magnetic fields, gravitational fields, uh, all sorts of, of, of fields. And our universe is quantum mechanical, so really they're, they're quantum fields described by, by quantum field theory. But don't worry, we won't need a lot of the details of quantum field theory. Um, but there are these quantum fields propagating near the horizon. So what happens? To those quantum fields. Well, it's just a fact about quantum field theory um, that any low energy state on some region has a lot of entanglement. It's like a, it's a Hamiltonian that couples together two different systems. So it's eigenstates, it's low energy eigenstates are entangled. Okay. So in particular, if we look at fields just outside the black hole horizon, those will be entangled with fields just inside the black hole. Nothing to do special to the horizon. It's just a fact about any two points in space that are, that are near each other. Um, but in particular, it's, it's true near the horizon. So this is then where, where the physics of the black hole comes into play, the, the gravity comes into play, which is that as we evolve forwards in time, the dynamics of the black hole to pull these, these no, modes that are very close to each other near the horizon apart. So the one just outside the horizon is able to escape out to sort of off to infinity over here. This is infinite radius far away from the black hole. Meanwhile, the one just inside can never escape. It just remains stuck inside the black hole and eventually it would hit the singularity. So rather than just having short range entanglement very close to the horizon, we end up with this really long range entanglement between modes off at asymptotic infinity and stuff inside, inside the black hole. And in fact, these modes at infinity just look like noisy thermal radiation thermal mixed state that's purified by the stuff inside um, at a temperature that is given by this complicated formula that, that's proportional to one over the mass of the black hole. So bigger black hole, the bigger the black hole is, the colder in fact it is. Astrophysical black holes are like, you know, billionth of a Kelvin or even less, incredibly cold objects, but they do have a non-zero temperature. They radiate uh, this Hawking radiation, very cold, cold. So this is really an extraordinary formula. It's an incredible achievement by, by Hawking to come up with it. I think really just looking at the formula, you can, can see what an achievement it is um, just by, by, by the different amounts of physics that are getting involved in this formula. Uh, so in particular, we, we have a factor of the speed of light cubed here. So clearly relativistic effects got involved in this formula. Um, we have a, a, a Newton's constant, G Newton. So that means that, that there was gravity involved, of course, with black holes. Uh, we have an H bar in there, so it's a quantum mechanical effect in the, the classical limit where H bar goes to zero, the temperature would just go to zero. Um, there's Boltzmann's constant in there, so we have, we have thermodynamics getting involved, of course, so it's about a temperature. And finally, there's a pi in there, so we have circles getting involved somehow as well. Uh, okay, so, so, um, so we now have, know that black holes have, have this non-zero temperature, and yeah, if I have a temperature and I have an energy, namely the mass of the black hole, um, then I can use the Clausius relation, dE d equals TdS, to also sort of you know, reverse engineer what the entropy S might be. And in this case, it turns out that an appropriate unit is just proportional to the area of the horizon of the black hole um, divided by four times Newton's constant. So this should feel kind of familiar from, from from something Tommy mentioned about the Ryutaki Nagi formula, exactly the same area of a 4G is showing up there. In fact, that's going to be at the heart of, of later stuff in this talk. We're going to see that the, those sort of formulas are, are very, very closely related to one another. Now, you know, as I've said things so far, then 
it's not quite clear what this entropy means. We just had some temperature and some energy, and we, we use this thermodynamics relation to, to, to work out a, a, a quantity S that we're calling the entropy. But there's something that's been recently dubbed the central dogma of black hole physics, which is basically the assumption that you know, this entropy is the same as the ordinary entropies you have in, in everyday thermodynamics. Um, in other words, it's counting the logarithm of the number of different sort of microstates that a black hole can be and the number of different, different you know, fundamental microscopic descriptions of, of the state of the black hole. Um, so this is known to be true in string theory. It's known to be true in ADS-CFT in very precise ways. But there's also very strong evidence more generally that's true. In particular, black holes obey a whole set of laws of thermodynamics that are analogous to the ordinary laws of thermodynamics. This really, really seems to be the, the thermodynamic entropy of a black hole. So in this talk, I'm gonna, gonna assume that it's true. Okay, so now let's start, let our, our black hole evaporate some more, and we're gonna see this, this black hole information problem show up. So initially, I wanna emphasize the fact that the Hawking radiation is noisy is, is not problematic at all, right? Like in, in ordinary quantum mechanics, we have some unitary evolution, that can entangle different subsystems and, and the individual subsystems can be in an analysis state. But as we allow the black hole to evaporate for longer and longer, then modes that started closer and closer to the horizon are able to escape, they become Hawking radiation, and we get more and more Hawking radiation that is still entangled with the interior of the black hole. So this entanglement entropy just rises and rises and rises, we get more and more noisy Hawking radiation. At some point, if we just extrapolate this, then that entanglement entropy will actually become larger than the Bekenstein Hawking entropy of the black hole. This happens at a time that's commonly called the page time. It's when the black hole has roughly half evaporated. And it's important that at this point, the black hole is still very large. Our sort of classical description of the black hole should still be very good, big, good. Like it, it's still, you know, curvatures are low. There's no crazy stuff going on here. We wouldn't expect strong quantum gravitational effects. Okay, so is this a problem? Well, that's a, a matter of some debate, um, but as long as you accept uh, the central dogma of, of black hole physics that I just described in the previous slide, then you know that this tells us that something is very weird. Going on. This tells us this is inconsistent with the ordinary rules of quantum mechanics. Because in ordinary quantum mechanics, if the global state is pure, the state of black hole plus Hawking radiation is pure, then both the black hole and the Hawking radiation need to have the same entanglement entropy. But clearly the black hole can't have an entanglement entropy that's larger than its Bekenstein Hawking entropy if the Bekenstein Hawking entropy is telling you the log of the total number of microstates. Even if the black hole is maximally entangled, it would still have an entanglement entropy that's just equal to its Bekenstein Hawking entropy. So at this point, you really only have two more. Either you say that, okay, at this point, the global state is actually just mixed. Information was lost. We do not have, have the ordinary laws of unitary evolution. That was Hawking's answer. Or we have to say that at some point at or before this time, then the entanglement entropy has to start decreasing and going back down. And at this point, I think, you know, the generally accepted idea is that that's what happens with us. Okay, so before I sort of talk about you know, the, the modern day gravitational calculations that are showing that happen, I want to talk about why people originally thought it might happen and, and, and how they made these conjectures that actually have turned out to be incredibly accurate. So in particular, a beautiful paper by Page in 1993 and then by Hayden and Presto in 2003. Okay, so let's start with Don Page's idea. So what Don Page said is he basically just made a guess so let's just model black holes by some random complicated unitary circuit. Okay, let's assume that they're unitary, uh, but assume also that there's some pretty complicated random looking unitary and see what happens. So we have our input state to the black hole, all the matter that fell in and so on, call that psi. Then we apply a random unitary to it. And then we'll say that a load of these qubits describe the Hawking radiation, the number of quanta of Hawking radiation we've had come out. And then the remaining ones describe the sort of microstate of the black hole. Okay, so the number of qubits here is like the Bekenstein Hawking entropy of the black hole. And what he observed, and actually he was, was the first person to prove this, even though it's, it's since become a, a hugely important result in, in quantum information theory. At the time, quantum information theory didn't exist. So 
or barely existed. So, so you know, people thinking about black holes were the first, first to care about this. Uh, is that as long as we've had the black hole is less than half of backward until we've hit this page time, uh, then the black radiation will actually be in this toy model in something very close to the maximum mixed state. This stupid toy model suggests that actually Hawking's answer should be correct as long as it possibly can be. It's only at the very last minute, just before you get a paradox that would violate, violate unitarity, um, that this radiation state starts becoming not maximally mixed, you have more than half, and then the entropy starts going down. So in general, the entanglement entropy of the radiation, just given by the smaller of the number of qubits of radiation that we have, and the number of qubits describing the black hole just avoids violating this, this unitarity bound of, of the number of qubits inside the black hole. Okay, so this is called the page curve. Um, slightly confusingly, both the, the answer for random unit trees and the answer for black holes are both called the page curves, even though they're subtly different. Um, but yeah, Don Page you know, was motivated by black holes and then he actually proved this result for random unit trees. So then in 2007, uh, Patrick Hayden and John Kresko, um, started thinking about something slightly more sophisticated. And by this time, quantum information theory had really kicked off. And both, both you know, Patrick at the time was a computer science professor, John Presco had, had been interested in black holes, but then had gone off to work on quantum computers. And so they had a lot more tools in their arsenal. So they asked a more sophisticated question. They said, let's say that we have an old black hole that's already maximally entangled with its radiation. So this is the maximally entangled state here. And then let's say we just throw a small little bit of extra stuff into the black hole. Okay, let's just make it one little qubit, which we'll call a dark. And then we'll let the black hole evolve for a bit more, which we'll, we'll treat as a random unit. It turns out that all you need to do once everything's got scrambled up by this random unit is collect a handful more, more qubits, maybe four or five more qubits. And then uh, the remaining qubits of the black hole the black hole will end up maximally entangled. There's no information about the diary anymore in the state of the black hole. And so effectively, the diary must have ended up encoded in the state of the Hawking radiation. Not just the state of these five qubits, but also the state of all the earlier Hawking radiation that it was maximally entangled. So we barely have to wait at all to, to recover these qubits as long as everything has got scrambled up. So how long does it take for everything to get scrambled up? Well, that's an interesting question. For example, if we had some, some 1D local spin chain or something, it would take a time on order the number of qubits, which would be very, very long. And Patrick and John's guess was that we should model the black hole by some local circuit where we're allowed to couple any qubit to any other qubit. So this is like a, a circuit model of a black hole where we're allowed only like two local gates, um, but we're allowed any two local gates that, that couple together any pair of qubits. And in that case, with a random circuit, then you don't have to wait very long at all to scramble everything up. You just need to wait time this order the logarithm of the number of qubits. Um, so actually, you know, you get this thing called fast scrambling very, very quickly. Everything gets scrambled up, and then you wait a couple more qubits, and the diary gets spat back out. In fact, a few years later, Schenker and Stanford, for the first time, did, did sort of actual calculations in a black hole that showed exactly this sort of scrambling time shown. So they were interested in what's called out of time order correlation functions, which is a very important probe of, of scrambling and quantum chaos. And they were able to calculate them pretty easily using gravity. I'll talk a bit about the calculation at the end of this talk. Um, and they got exactly this sort of time scale proportional to the logarithm, the number of qubits describing black hole. And they actually got a specific number out, out the front uh, proportional to the temperature, the inverse temperature of the black hole. Uh, so, yeah, it seems like even though you know, Hawking was saying information is lost forever, if we want black holes to be unitary, actually the opposite has to be true. If we throw things into an old black hole, the information gets spat out almost immediately. So Hayden and Presco called this black hole mirror. The information gets mirrored straight back out very, very quickly. And in fact, yeah, as I say, again, looking ahead, in gravity, we can show that this is indeed the case. Okay. So let me now, now go on to the sort of really recent developments of how, how information actually gets out, how we can, rather than just doing these toy models of, of unitary circuits or whatever, and saying, hey, maybe this is how black holes work. Now we can actually do, do calculations with black holes and, and see that that's exactly what happens. 
So this is, there's a couple of papers, one by me and one by Almiri Engelhardt and Maxfield, May 2019. And then there was another round of papers, one by me, Schenker, Stanford, and, and Yang, uh, one by Almiri Hart, Narasina, Shigulian, and Tejdini in November 2019. Okay. So let's think again about Hawking's, Hawking's claim that uh, you know, he had this robust, accurate, hyper approximation calculation that showed that the Hawking radiation was in thermal state. Well, what he was actually calculating, if you really think about how his calculation properly, is he's showing that if you compute some matrix element of the Hawking radiation density matrix, then it looks thermal. Okay? The, the you know, individual matrix elements look the same as you get from considering the thermal and thermal. But of course, there's some errors to his calculation. At least there exists non, what's called non-perturbative exponentially small, like, like two to the order two to the minus number of qubits errors in this calculation. Okay, so it's not completely, completely accurate. But the Hawking radiation the density matrix itself is an exponentially big matrix, right? It's order the dimension of the Hilbert space, which is exponential to the number of qubits in the Hilbert space. So just adding these tiny, tiny corrections to the individual matrix elements, depending on what those corrections are, can completely change properties of the density matrix, and in particular can completely change its, its entanglement energy. Okay, they can make the density, full density matrix be very far away from a, a thermal state, even if the individual matrix elements are very, very far away. So actually, as a calculation of entanglement entropy, then Hawking's calculation can't be trusted at all. As a calculation of matrix elements, it's great, the entanglement entropy is really, really bad. It's completely out of control, sort of well before you reach the page. What we want to do, solution to this, is try and do a calculation that actually directly just computes the entanglement entropy for us. Rather than computing individual matrix elements, doing exponentially many different calculations, each with its own little error that we don't have good control over, and then trying to use that to work out the final. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, there's an annoying fact the entanglement entropy is, is sort of not an observable, right? There's, there's, there's no way using a measurement on a single copy of a state to tell whether it was an entangled state or not. Um, so this is sort of, you know, this makes it hard to, to compute directly. And there's close, closely related classical analog to this, which is if we have some, some unknown but fixed state, um, then that's indistinguishable from sort of a noisy unknown dot distribution if we only get a single sample of the, from the distribution, right? With a single sample from the distribution, you have no idea whether it's noisy or not because you only get to see, see one copy. But of course, if you have two samples, you could check whether the, the samples are identical or not, right? Um, that, that the probability they are is given by the sum over, over all possibilities times pi squared, which is equal to one if it's some, some deterministic thing, if it's the same thing every time. But it's much, much less than one if it's some, some very noisy thing where a totally random thing gets spat out. Each time. So there's an analog to this in quantum mechanics, which is that if we take two copies of our, our quantum state rho, then there's an observable that just swaps those two copies. It's a Hermitian observable, and its expectation value is just given by the trace of the density matrix squared. That's the analog of this sum over p squared. So if it's an unentangled state, a pure state, then we have trace rate squared equals one, but if it's some highly entangled subsystem, then it's much, much less. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna try and do this computation to a black hole. So how do you do that computation? Um, well, the sort of only rules we have for, for quantum gravity are, are what's called Feynman part integrals. Um, so what is a Feynman part integral? Well, for, for some sort of single particle quantum mechanics, it says that you, you have some starting position of the particle and some ending position. Those are your boundary conditions. And then you just integrate over all paths from the starting condition to the ending condition. Okay, and each of those paths gets weighted by, by some factor, e to the is, and you just sum over all of them. Okay, so what's the analog of this in, in quantum gravity? Well, the sort of dynamical degree of freedom in, in quantum gravity is the, the geometries of the space time. Okay, so what we do is we integrate over geometries of space time. And in fact, we can be even more general and also sum over the different topologies of space time. So that's the, the obvious set of rules that we should be using to do these computations. So let's try to do them. Um, so if you would compute trace row squared for some Hawking radiation in this way, um, then we have two copies of row. 
So we have two copies of a black hole, two copies of Hawking radiation. It turns out there's two different topologies that, that contribute important contributions to the dark energy. The first is to just have two, two black holes that have nothing to do with one another, okay? Um, and they just each have their, their independent thing and there's, there's nothing weird quantum gravitational going on. In that case, we just get the Hawking answer that the entanglement entropy just, or trace row squared just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller over time. But there's another topology that also matters. And that's to have two black holes connected together by, a, by what's called a space-time wormhole. Okay, so these are slightly different to the topologies that to the wormholes that Tommy was talking about earlier. So Tommy's wormhole is what's called a spatial wormhole. It's a shortcut between two points in space that sort of continues to exist through space-time. This is a space-time wormhole that is just a shortcut between two points in space-time in some, some gravitational path integral calculation. It's more like some quantum tunneling effect that happens, but then just, you know, it's just some temporary effect and then it disappears. It's not like some permanent object that appears in space. So this thing gives a very small contribution to trace row squared, but unlike the ordinary contribution, it doesn't get smaller as our black hole evaporates more and more. Okay, instead, actually, as the black hole evaporates, the black hole becomes smaller and therefore less classical. And so this contribution actually gets bigger. So at a certain point, this contribution from this crazy space-time wormhole becomes bigger than the tiny contribution from just ordinary two separate black holes. It's the point where that changeover happens at exactly the page time. So that's exactly the point where we start seeing the noisiness of the Hawking radiation get less. That's exactly what we wanted to see to get consistency with one another. Of course, really, you know, trace ray squared is not a great quantity to compute how noisy something is. Really, what we want to compute is the entanglement entropy minus trace of row log row. So there's a nice formula for the entanglement entropy, just fine using L'Hopital's rule. Just take trace of row to the n for arbitrary values of n, and then take its derivative as n goes to one. This will give you the taking the derivative with respect to n gives you exactly that log. So this sort of seems harder to calculate. But what we can do is look at look at integer n for n greater than one. And then we have like n different copies of a black hole. It turns out after the page time, the, the dominant configuration of, of all these black holes is to have them all be connected together by some big octopus like multi boundary space time wormhole crazy thing that looks a bit like this. Okay, so that's great, but that's just integer n. We can't, we can't take a derivative on the integers. That's, that's not really helping us. It turns out there's a very clever trick. Um, and the trick is that we note that this multi boundary crazy space time wormhole thing has a symmetry as a symmetry where you sort of spin it around a little bit and move this, this black hole over to this black hole, this one to this one, and so on all the way around the circle. And then we can look at the quotient of the whole geometry by that symmetry. In other words, we just look at one of these little wedges and glue this line directly onto this line and this line at the back directly onto this line at the back. Now we just have one boundary rather than n, so that's, that's a lot better. Um, and the only weird thing is that if we, there's this point in the center, and if we go on a little loop around this point at the center at a radius epsilon, rather than having to go two pi epsilon distance around, we only have to go two pi epsilon over n, and then we get glued back on to where we started. This is like there's a tip of a cone sitting at the, the center of this wedge, right? Imagine gluing to here to here. You won't be able to do it with a flat sheet of paper, but you can do it and end up with your paper looking like the tip of a cone. This is what's called the conical singularity. And now there's no reason why, why you need to sort of have n to be an integer, right? You just have a, a conical singularity that, you know, the, the sharpness of the cone, you can just dial to arbitrary non-integer value. So then we can take the limit, n goes to one, because that's the thing we're interested in to compute the entanglement entropy. And magically, it turns out that all that matters uh, as n goes to one, we no longer have any con conical singularity because we're no longer doing any quotient. All that matters is the original black hole geometry plus the location where this sort of special conical singularity goes to as we take the limit n goes to one and it, it sort of disappears. Okay, because we're taking a derivative at n goes to one, then there's sort of a slight relic of the n not equal to one. Okay, so this is the most technical slide of the talk. So if you're lost, don't worry, because the answer in a minute is going to be going to be kind of simple, and you can forget about all these technical details. 
But it is an incredibly beautiful argument. It goes back to, to Lukovic and Maldacino in, in 2013. Uh, so I do like to include it because it, it's such a neat trick to, to deal with these non integer values and end up taking a derivative with respect to n. So what's the final answer? I'm just going to sort of skip ahead and tell you how it works out when you, you do this complicated calculation. You end up finding that as n goes to 1, uh, this conical singularity become, always becomes a special surface called a quantum extremum surface. So what is that? It's a surface that's an extremum you know, roughly speaking, a minimum, but a, a minimum in spatial direction and a maximum in time like direction. But basically, area. It's area plus a quantum correction, where the, the quantum correction is, is a certain bulk entanglement entropy of, of, of basically everything in the radiation plus fields that are further into the black hole than this special surface. Then you get the answer, final answer for the entanglement entropy of your radiation. That is just this, this area plus bulk entropy for that special surface. OK, so that sounds kind of complicated, but it's really very simple, it's similar to the, the, the Ryutaki Nagi formula that um, Tommy was talking about in the talk, in his introductory talk earlier, where you just sort of minimize the area of a surface anchored on some boundary. And in fact, this is just sort of the quantum corrected version of, of exactly that formula. Um, we just replaced area over 4G by area over 4G plus this, this bulk, bulk entanglement entropy. Okay. And in fact, this whole argument about taking quotients and stuff was originally developed to derive that reattacking of formula. Then, then the tricks just got applied to these more general, more quantum concepts. Okay. So that was that's the sort of technical part over. The, the conclusion is that when we actually want to compute the entanglement entropy. We don't need to go through this whole rigmarole of, of you know, finding space-time wormhole solutions to Einstein's equations and, and calculating what answer they give for trace rate, rate squared and stuff. We just have to look at the sort of Hawking's answer to what happens to the black hole, but then look, find this special surface and work out its area plus, plus bulk entropy correction. Okay, We just have to use this quantum correct version of the, the we attacking that. So what happens when we do that? Well, uh, before the page time, you know, everything just works out like, like Hawking suggested. But after the page time, it turns out that this, this quantum extremal surface just sort of sits uh, very near the horizon of the black hole. Actually, it's just a tiny little bit, like a Planckian distance inside the horizon. As the more Hawking radi radiation escapes, as we look at the entanglement entropy of a larger amount of, of Hawking radiation, the special surface sort of moves up to along the horizon, sort of up into the right, up into this top corner. And remember, this black hole is evaporating, so it's getting smaller and smaller with time. So the area of this special surface is getting smaller with time. The entanglement entropy of the Hawking radiation is going down rather than going up. So after the page time, we find that this entanglement entropy is actually given by the area of the special surface over 4G is almost exactly the, the vacuum team Hawking entropy of the black hole. OK, so that gives you the page curve. I want to talk very quickly about how you can also see, see sort of Hayden Fresco, um, but I do want to talk a bit about, about sort of more, more experimental quantum computing applications. So just, just talk for, for a couple of minutes about this, just sort of get through it quickly. Turns out there's a sort of general purpose set of uh, techniques for doing quantum error correction called the PETS map. Um, that you can use to, to figure out what information is in the, the radiation. And in effect, what this PETS map does is it involves simulating the black hole back, the evaporation process on some quantum computer that you're using to decode the radiation, and then comparing your simulated radiation to the real radiation and working out what your initial state must have been. Magically, turns out when you do this, when you do the mathematical calculations, you find that the information escapes because the actual black hole, that's the, like, the real black hole, gets connected to the simulation of the black hole using a space-time world. Um, so this is, is totally insane. This is, this is you know, this doesn't make any sense. I, I have no idea how literally you need to take it, but the answer surely has to be, be not very. Um, but that is what the maths say. Um, and it, it all checks out, and you get very precise answers. Um, so in particular, there are two constraints on having this work, two constraints on whether you can actually pull the information out through your space-time work. The first is you need to be after the page time. Otherwise, you can just never make the wormhole at all. And the second is that the information you want 
has to be inside this special quantum extremal surface. Because it's only the stuff inside the quantum extremal surface that actually gets pulled through the wormhole. Okay, so how, how does this give us this Hayden Prescott decoding criterion that they've conjectured just by, say, by thinking about on these bundle paths? So let's say we throw this, this diary into the black hole. It's just falling in along some, some world line, starting at the infinity, and it's falling into the black hole. When does that information get out? Well, before the page time, obviously, there's no wormhole, so, so no information has got out. What about after the page time? If we've literally just thrown it in, then its world line passes to the right of this special surface, this quantum extremal surface. So it passes through this blue region here. What that means is that it can't be pulled through the wormhole. Even if we make a wormhole, it will only pull out this green region. And so we can't pull out the information we want. We can't learn what it is. So the information hasn't yet escaped through the Hawking radiation. But now let's let a little bit more Hawking radiation escape. Let's collect a bit more Hawking radiation and see what we have. As we collect more Hawking radiation, the special surface continues to track up and to the right along the horizon. So very quickly, the same world line that fell into the black hole now goes to the left of the quantum extremal surface. Turns out all we need to do is wait for exactly the scrambling time. Then it will be in this green region to the left of the quantum extremal surface, technically called the entanglement wedge, but don't worry about that. It means it can be pulled out through the wormhole and we can, you know, the information is escaped. We, 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 we learn that we can successfully get out the so we're getting exactly the answer that Hayden and Prescott predicted with their very stupid toy models of, of random unitaries uh, by doing a, a very concrete gravity calculation. Okay, so that's sort of you know all the, the, the main quantum gravity of this talk. Now I want to spend the last last 10 minutes or so talking about, you know, okay, how does this this relate to people wanting to, to make quantum computers? Uh, what what you know, what can you guys take away from all this if you're, you're going to go off and, and do experiments, AMO experiments, you know, cold atoms experiments, superconducting qubit experiments, whatever. Um, so why should you work, build an experimental lab? So this is where I really wanted Tommy to do this, this big introduction of, of ADS-CFT because I, I didn't want to go through all the, the details of that. Um, but now he has, I can say that, that you know, ADS-CFT Let's us make a black hole using our quantum computer, just, just using like, you know, uh, ordinary quantum mechanics on the back. In particular, something like SYK model, you just need sort of n qubits where, where maybe, you know, n is 100, 200, whatever it might be, and couple them all together some, some random way. Uh, and we're able to make something that looks, looks very similar to, to, um, to, to a black hole, to, to gravitational calculation. Um, so why should you care about this? Well, um, you know, if nothing else, it gives like a, a highly non-trivial test of how well your quantum computer is working. Because there's a lot of these, these uh, you know, things involving scrambling and stuff like that, that if, you, if you're not building a very good quantum computer, if you have too much noise, you won't be able to see them at all. Uh, and they're very complicated things to do. You know, they're sort of like the random quantum circuits that we use to, to prove our quantum computer is, is good. Um, but certain observables that are uh, hard to make work well can still be easily found using the gravitational calculations involving black holes. So a sort of boring example would be to say couple an SYK model to some bath to make a sort of evacuating black hole, allow that black hole to evaporate. You end up with a load of Hawking radiation sitting in your, your bath. And then do sort of a swap test explicitly on this that bath and check that your, your bath is in a pure state. Of course it will be because, because everything I just said is like obviously in quantum mechanics, the only reason to relate it to, to a black hole is, is you know these crazy dualities. So it's it's not really telling you anything you didn't know would happen, but it's it's you know, it's definitely definitely proving that your 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 quantum computer is doing a very good job keeping everything co coherent. And it's like, you know, you can title your paper. Like testing evaporating black holes with with uh, you know, cold atoms or something, which would sound very cool. Um, go in nature article, maybe I don't know. Um, so so that's a sort of boring example, but a, a non-trivial thing to do. And yeah, you, know, you could make more exciting versions of it. More interesting examples to me are things like scrambling and and one I'll talk about in just a couple of slides with reversible wormholes, where there's 
the physics from black hole point of view can be kind of simple, or almost classical. But from a quantum mechanics point of view, it's very non-trivial, very, very sort of complicated many body physics going on where we don't have as precise calculation. Then we can explicitly, um, if we can do those tests on a, on a quantum computer, we can check that the, the heuristic arguments and the quantum mechanics sides are right. We can check that our black hole duality is, is behaving correctly. And we can test that our, our quantum computer is actually doing something, something very, very interesting. Of course, even more interesting still, but less hard to predict, would be to just, just do some of these complicated experiments and see some, some new ex effect just at an experimental level, right? And then even more ambitiously, you could hope to then, then explain this effect using black holes. Something like traversable wormholes is a, a very simple effect from black hole point of view, but it was only discovered in the last, last five years. Um, so that would be incredibly cool. That would be, you know, uh, for the first time, sort of, sort of experimental input into quantum gravity would be very, very exciting. Uh, so obviously there's challenges to this from an experimental point of view uh, and from a theoretical point of view for that matter. So, so I have not seen anyone come up with a really good efficient protocol for, for preparing a thermofield double state, the this, this state Tommy talked about that's the dual to a, a two-sided black hole, or even sort of a very good approximation to it. Um, I think it should be possible, but I, I don't really know the best way to do it. Uh, experimental point of view, you've got to have these alterable couplings, you know, some something like these superconducting chips, then that's that's kind of non-trivial to do. Also, a lot of these 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 tests, you need to have very good control over your habitat, but things just won't work very well. Um, so yeah, just to, just to give you very briefly a couple of examples. So so one nice example where you can see very clearly what happens in the black hole side, but it's, it's sort of much less obvious from the, the quantum mechanics side is to, to do a test of, of scrambling and when scrambling happens. So how this works is we, we start with some, some product to belt pairs on the two sides. Um, like, you know, as, as, and then we, we evolve one side backwards in time using some complicated chaotic Hamiltonian. When we've evolved backwards in time, we're just gonna take a random qubit and we're gonna perturb it. We're gonna apply some, some operator or some noise to it or, or whatever we might wanna do. And then we're gonna evolve back forwards in time. If you have scrambling, then after enough time, that scrambling should basically destroy all correlations between the, the bell pairs on the two sides. So all correlations between one side of the bell pair and the other side of the bell pair in every qubit at once. So this calculation is very closely related to the out of time order correlators mentioned earlier. Gravitational point of view is really just a, an analytic, yeah, it's just an analytic continuation of them basically. Um, but you can you can see very, very clearly what happens from, from this, this picture of a black hole. Uh, so what the perturbation does is it goes back into the past and then it throws in some, some, some energy, some matter into the black hole, some particle that then just falls into the middle of the black hole. At one point of time. So what does that do? Well, it creates some back reaction. If we throw it in far enough back into, black, into the past, then that thing falling in will have a lot of energy. You have a lot of energy in one place, you, it back creates on the matter and it, it changes the geometry of the space time. And actually the way in which it changes the geometry is it makes this wormhole, makes the distance from one end, end to the other just a little bit longer. What does that do? It decreases the correlation between two ends. In quantum field theory, correlation decays with distance. Okay, so just by, by the classical physics of this thing falling into the black hole, we can see that this correlation starts to exponentially, exponentially decay away. Um, and you, you, you get exactly the scrambling physics that we want to have, very explicit calculation. It's very cool. Um, so the last example I want to give, another thing you can, again, this one was actually we first discovered on the gravity side rather than, rather than have anyone having any idea it could be done using, using quantum chaos, using, using these sort of you know, very, very chaotic quantum systems, is that if we just turn on some very simple coupling between the left boundary here and the right boundary here, just at time t equals zero, then it can actually have the effect of shortening the wormhole. It sort of pulls the two boundaries together so that this wormhole that gets a bit shorter. What that does is it makes the wormhole traversable. It means if we threw something in way back in the past here, rather than getting stuck and inevitably falling into the, the singularity, as, as Tommy talked about, can actually sneak all the way through and if it times it just right, it can make it out the other side, and it'll just appear on the other side of the wormhole as some, some, some simple local thing on, on my left CFT. 
Okay, so that's some totally weird effect that, uh, you know, no reason to expect that would happen just by, by turning on this coupling. But after a lot of work there by, by people, including, including people at Berkeley and in Norm's group and so on, and some others, we now have pretty good heuristic explanations of what's going on in terms of like operator growth in, 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 in these sort of quantum mechanical models. But I would still say that by far the most precise calculation for uh, in terms of the gravitational physics. So this is sort of closely related to quantum teleportation, right? We have these two entangled states. You can think of this coupling as just measuring one side and then evolving this left side, depending on, on the measurement outcome. And magically, the thing that was over on this side ends up over on the left hand side. So that's some totally cool effect. It's something that you could, you could hope to, to, to experimentally implement in the next, next few years. It's, it's pretty hard to do, but, but people are already thinking about it. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of, you know, that was, that was all very brief overviews. There's a lot of more exciting stuff that, that can be done. Um, so let me end the talk by just, just making a couple of final comments. Um, so if you one thing you take away from this talk, it's that you know, we have learned an awful, awful lot over the last couple of decades about the quantum mechanics of black holes. And in fact, they've gone from just this totally mysterious thing where who knows what, what how they work, like everything's like out the window, like anything could happen. Is it even unitary? Who knows? To a pretty highly developed theory where actually, you know, given that it's some chaotic, like, like large end system, we can often do more precise predictions for, for what happens using black holes uh, than we can actually do analytically or numerically on the, the quantum mechanics side. So it's actually now a, a sort of, you know, test bed where we can do precision calculations and, and use them to gain heuristic insight into uh, large end quantum mechanics, large end chaotic quantum mechanics. In particular, you know, I spent a lot of the talk on, on this point because it's the stuff I was involved with, but we can now track exactly sort of when and how the information gets out of the quantum radiation. We see not only that there's no information loss, but we can, we can make very precise calculations that, that sort of exactly agree with the, the, the sort of inspired guesses that, that people like John Page and Hayden and Presco and so on were making way back in the day. Um, and then, Finally, sort of trying to trying to simulate black holes, trying to simulate these these ADS CFT systems on on near term quantum devices, can be a sort of fun and exciting challenge for experimentalists. It can both let you you, you test how your quantum computer is working, and potentially learn some some cool new stuff about both quantum gravity and and you know large large end quantum field theory, large end quantum mechanics, uh, quantum chaos stuff like that. Uh, so I think there's a lot of lot of interesting physics to be learned from that. Uh, for the first time ever, we could be, be sort of having quantum gravity be an experiment in science, only in a, a, a very particular sense, uh, more, you know, more simulations of, of quantum gravity than actual quantum gravity, but still we can have experimental input into quantum gravity, which would be hugely, hugely exciting. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all I have for you guys. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you got something out of it, enjoyed it. Um, yeah, any questions? All right. Uh, can we all thank Jeff for his talk? And um, now for the next 20 minutes or so, we'll have a discussion section uh, for anyone in the audience to ask questions. And then around 1.40, um, we'll kick the, the professors out and have a, another discussion section with just grad students and postdocs. Uh, so for to open off this discussion section, um, Ehud just raised his hand. Can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, I just unmute, unmuted, thanks. Uh, thank you for a really, really nice talk. Um, I have a question about your last um, uh, last slide on uh, this yep. transversible wormhole. Just to make sure I understand, this is uh, really identical to or equivalent to uh, just out of time order correlation? Um, yeah, it's closely related to that, yeah. Um, like, the, the physics involved is the same in that it's it's coming from this fast scrambling physics. Uh, I think the, yeah, you know, uh, but I don't think it's as simple as if you knew there was an out of time or the, or the correlation functions made play a certain way, you immediately would see that this happens, right? Like like, I, I, you know, the original the original paper, I think they weren't even even thinking about out of time or the correlations. I think right. it was a paper by Madison Stanford Yang where they sort of really made clear that yeah, it's coming from. From the same essential physics um but the fact that you sort of have this this 
some, some simple, effectively what you're doing is you're like swapping in a qubit here, and then you're doing scrambling time evolution and stuff, and then it's just sort of popping back out here. Um, it's, it's at least at the surface level, it's a pretty different effect from, from out of time order correlation. Yeah, I guess if it's if all the couplings are unitary, then it doesn't look like teleportation. It looks like it's just unitary propagation, right? Or yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so, so the connection to teleportation is that the the form of this coupling, roughly speaking, you can think of it as like e to the i epsilon times a sum over sort of Pauli z on here, Pauli z on here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so then you can do that by just measuring this entire thing, load of z's here, and then applying e to the plus i Pauli z or e to the minus i epsilon Pauli z, depending on, on which measurement outcome you've got over on the right hand side. So at that point, it's, it's teleportation, ordinary classical, okay. you know, classical bit teleportation. Um, but yeah, the, the, the simplest way to do it is just a coupling that turns on the two sides, and sort of then there's the yeah, you know, it's like less surprising the teleportation that you can can get the information across. The fact that this particular simple protocol works, and particularly the fact that the thing just comes out in a sort of simple unencoded state up here, is yeah. pretty surprising. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, everything's got very very scrambled up, and then you just couple the things and then let it scramble some more, and then magically you've unscrambled it. Yeah, you know, the things have got sort of reflected across by by yeah. having this coupling. It's also it's important, by the way, that you throw this in. If you don't throw this in too early, if there's too much scrambling up, then then this just in general won't really work. It's about having it like almost fully scrambled, but not not quite. So it's a weird effect. Um, yeah. Thanks, uh, Norm. You raised your hand. Yeah. Uh, super nice talk, Jeff. Um, I wanted to poke a little bit at this uh, quantum gravity as an experimental science statement, and maybe to follow up on Ehud's um, yep. question about teleportation. So, I mean, I'm used to thinking about teleportation in like Nielsen and Chuang, and you know, learning about it as like the basis of like secure communication and things like this. And I'm kind of just wondering, from that, you know, from that perspective, does you know these insights and in thinking about these traversable wormholes as teleportation is there some design principle from like a many body fast scrambling perspective that you know is applicable or says that somehow there's a quantum communication protocol that's very efficient and fast motivated by a black hole i don't know that these things are actually the most useful protocols to do quantum teleportation uh, but what I would say is is yeah the sense in which quantum teleportation is is like secure quantum communication because the classical bits are just random. I think that is closely related to the fact that, you know, rather than sending the information from this right boundary over to this left boundary, you're just throwing it in and then just doing some stuff that's sort of unrelated to the stuff that got thrown in, connecting the two boundaries that, that doesn't know about the stuff you threw in, but has the effect of opening up this, this traversable wormhole and it's then able to make it all the way through. And the fact that it goes through the wormhole rather than rather than sort of outside through the coupling. Uh, I think that's that's the analogous statement to, to the idea that this is like cryptographically protected in some way. Um, yeah, like I, I, I don't know. I, I think possibly you and, you and Tommy and people might be better qualified than me to answer whether there's, there's you know, sort of teleportation by size or whatever you want to call it is, is likely to have any, any practical uses, but my, my instinct is it's a very, very interesting effect phenomenologically, but probably not very practical for, for quantum communication or anything like that. I think I probably yeah. agree. <laughs> um, Lynn, you raised your hand. Yes, uh, thank you. Thanks for the nice talk. As uh, someone with a math background, I think I know maybe understand maybe 10% of the talk because uh, I know a little bit about uh, uh, quantum circuits and absolutely nothing about, about the black hole. Uh, so I just wonder from the quantum circuit side, uh, in order to make a concrete uh, circuit to simulate something that is of relevance to this uh, black hole uh, quantum, uh, uh, what, black hole question, what kind of random circuits uh, do you think would be ideal? Is that like anything or uh, from the heart or 
uh, or there's some special structure that would matter or yeah. Often, often it, it depends which physics you're interested in. Uh -huh. uh, so, so significant parts, say something like the page curve, then, then like how random things, you know, we'll, we'll just, just looking at how random circuits will give you the right answer. Um, but normally it's not actually need, you're not actually needing it to be how random. And that's not like the important thing. The important thing is that it's like some, some unitary two design or something like that. So uh -huh. normally, you know, you just need something that looks like a high random thing for, for pretty simple calculations. Um, mm -hmm. So, so yeah, a lot just unitary two design stuff, but say this, this traversable wormhole thing, uh, a unitary two design is sort of totally scrambling everything up. Um, and actually you don't want to totally scramble everything up. Otherwise you can't get very much information through for, for technical reasons. You want to like not quite have scrambled everything up. And then, um, yeah, you really do need sort of like, like uh, uh, an actual Hamiltonian, I think like some, some chaotic Hamiltonian. I don't know of any, any random circuits that will do the job. So um, does it matter if you actually know what the Hamiltonian looks like? Uh, I think it would, I think the physics should be pretty universal. So, so for example, in the SYK model, it's like a, a Hamiltonian drawn from some ensemble, right? So, so Tommy showed this, this thing with these fermions, but basically what that is, is, is you know, roughly speaking, you know, products, any product of four Pauli operators on four random qubits is a term in your Hamiltonian with a random Gaussian random coefficient in front of it. So you sort of have all possible ways of coupling together four different qubits at the same time. Um, and yeah, then you just, just let everything evolve. Yeah, but th that will work for sort of almost all, all uh, things in that ensemble in the large end limit. Um, so the, the Hamiltonian can be pretty generic as long as it's like chaotic. Uh, and I think you, you want it to be chaotic and you probably want it to be like all to all but k-local. So, so everything interacts together, but only k things, in, a small number of things interact in, in any given term. Right, so Why K local matters? Uh, if you have a random Hamiltonian where you just have any term, you know, with like, like you can have like completely like, like random Hamiltonian, then it will just scramble things up instantaneously. Um, like if, if I just take like a, a you know, GUE random Hamiltonian on like a large number of qubits, and then I, I right, then, then there's no notion of a, a simple operator versus a complicated operator anymore, right? So just everything gets totally mixed up immediately. To, to get this thing where you sort of start with something very simple down here, and then you do some simple coupling after scrambling stuff up a bit, and then it reappears as a simple thing up here, um, then, then you need, you know, you need to, that your Hamiltonian to res be respecting that notion of simple operators, right? To be respecting that, that product structure. Uh, so you need it to, to be k-local, to not couple together too many things at once. Uh, I'm not appreciating this k-local thing yet, because to me, you give me any Hamiltonian exponential yeah. high k, and h has a bounded norm, and a yeah. t of zero is just identity, so it's not mixing anything up. Yeah. So, right? It, it and then it will scramble yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if, you just, if you just want to see everything get scrambled up, totally yeah. random Hamiltonian will do the job. It just uh -huh. turns out that this physics isn't about what happens when everything is totally scrambled up. Uh -huh. It's what happens as things are sort of mostly but not quite scrambled up. And it, it's what happens specifically with these sort of k-local Hamiltonians as things become mostly but not quite scrambled up. Uh -huh. Finally, there are some good reference which describes what is desirable to be simulated uh, on a quantum computer and uh, written for non-black hole experts. This yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know something the, the something good off the top of my head. If anyone else like, like because because you're saying yeah. that quantum near term quantum computer right has, a, has uh, a great potential. I mean, at some point, it must be a very the, complicated there. There are certainly computer. papers. Yeah, there are certainly papers that are talking about like doing this, talking about simulating these sort of things. Um, but I'm not sure it's reached the point where there's like a, a big picture big picture review. Um, so, yeah, you know, there's, there's the quantum gravity in the lab papers would be an example by, by people at Google and Stanford and stuff. Um, yeah, that, that's, but it, it's, it's not reached the stage where I think there's, there's, 
that that's trying to be accessible, I think, for non-quantum gravity people. Um, but possibly in a few years' time, then there might be going to be something better. Um, okay. I don't know. Yeah, uh, one really fun. Yeah, sort of, yeah, would yeah. you like to chat, chat offline about this? Yeah, uh, yeah, sure, sure. From sure. the math department. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Cool. Um, Birgitta, do you want to? So, hi, Jeff. Thanks very much for the great talk. Um, so, my question is the coupling. So, what kind of coupling is this? Is this a gravitational coupling, or is this something that you know one could put into one could simulate with a Hamiltonian type term? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's really just turning turning on some Hamiltonian. That it, it's a very simple Hamiltonian. It's 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 roughly speaking, uh, just. Yeah, Z on, on a qubit over here and Z on the, the corresponding qubit here. And then oh. sum over a load of different qubits. Uh, and, and yeah, just turn on turn on that Hamiltonian as a small perturbation for a small amount of time. Um, and it will, will do this. Uh, yeah, that's but, sort of the interesting thing is how, how simple a coupling it is. Uh, but the, the initial state has to be a thermal field double state. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's sort of the hard part, actually, yeah, making yeah, yeah. that thermal field double state. Also, right. also, you know, you can only make it through if you've sent the thing in a scrambling time in the past, right? So you've got to effectively take your thermal field double state, evolve backwards in time by scrambling time using, and that is has to be some holographic Hamiltonian. So that's something like SYK, like all to all coupling. And then on the other side, you have to evolve right. forwards in time to see it come out. So that's that's the harder part. But turning on the coupling between the two sides is like the, the by far the easiest thing in the whole program. Okay, great, thank you. Emu? Uh, hi, hi. I hope I'm allowed to ask questions in this, in, in this section. So I want to follow on, uh, on Lin's question. So I think the, at a higher level, my question is, in what sense a quantum circuit is a black hole? Um, as far as I understand, um, so the, the quantum circuit reproduced some property that uh, info, some information dynamics in, in, a, in the black hole that is uh, given by a that is uh, that is verified by some gravitational calculations such as yeah. phase curve and hidden Pascal protocol and so on. So in that sense, so so first first of all, is 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 that fair to say a a all to all coupled k local random circuit that can also reproduce the scrambling time of black hole is a good model for for, for black hole. Uh, it comes down to like how good a model do you want, right? Um, yes. Say, so, say, so if you're just trying to guess the answers to certain things, then you know, maybe just like a hardware and immunity is like good enough, or maybe yes. you want some think about some local circuit with like things coupled all to all, and, and that will give you good intuition. Then something better might be like the SYK model, right, where you you have random four local four local fermionic terms, so it's like slightly different to, to four qubit terms, but not not terribly different. Um, and you have all of those in Hamiltonian, you do Hamiltonian evolution. So in that case, as, as Tommy mentioned, at low enough temperatures, there's like a, a provable mathematical equivalence between that and some, some gravitational theory at low temperatures. Okay. But then if you go to high temperature, higher temperatures, then, then the picture gets a bit vaguer, where, where you know the SYK model maybe still sort of looks like a, a bit like gravity with some matter in there and stuff, but it's like probably not an exact mathematical equivalence between the two things. But then you have like real much more complicated things. So the, the classic one is, is N equals four super Yang Mills, which is you know, do not worry about, about what that means, but it's just some some complicated quantum mechanical quantum field theory in, in conformal field theory in higher dimensions. That has some some very nice symmetry properties and stuff, and you know this is not proved, but it is conjectured that sort of at all temperatures that is just exactly mathematically equivalent to to string theory uh, with certain boundary conditions. Um, so it's it's you know, and we don't even know how to define string theory in full generality. We don't know how to define any theory of quantum gravity in full generality. String theory is the closer we can get, but it's still not like like really independently defined. Um, but the conjecture is that there, there should be some independent definition of it. And then there would be some way to do a mathematical rewriting of our quantum mechanical theory and show that it's equivalent to this, this string theory thing. Um, but simulating that on a quantum computer is a, a long way off. 
So in practice, the things we'll be doing would be more like the SYK model, where like in some limits, they look, they have the same mass as a black hole, but like, you know, there, there's not a true full duality. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, one last question from the professors, Norm. Okay, uh, just one, maybe, but follow, yeah, which is one last question. So from following up on EMU, something I've been wondering, I, maybe this was sort of effectively answered earlier, but I didn't fully understand it, is, um, so a lot of the stuff that, you know, Tommy and you've been talking about is sort of, you know, related to this ADS-CFT, this bulk boundary, there's this correspondence that's super important. But, you know, if I think about, um, I guess I, when one learns about sort of, you know, like, you know, astrophysical phenomenon and black holes in actual space, there's, you know, we think about usually the metric being like de Sitter space and not ADS. So, and I, as far as I understand, there's not exactly the same equivalence between like de Sitter space and conformal field theories. So maybe let me sort of kind of follow up on Emu's question a little bit. In what sense, you know, is the, are the things that we're learning about black holes relevant um, sort of precisely to the information dynamics in these astrophysical objects in our universe? Or is it sort of, you know, just assume that actually everything will really be exactly the same? So it may be a little bit of a naive question. No, that's a, a great question, actually. Um, so I think the, um, the great thing about ADS-CFT, and honestly, the great, a great thing about ADS, even if we didn't know about ADS-CFT, is it's very easy to ask very precisely well-defined questions. Right. The trouble with quantum gravity is if your geometry isn't even like well defined because it's quantum mechanical, then like even the questions you're asking could be like a bit vague and a bit like imprecisely defined. But ADS lets you let you ask very precise questions by asking them about the sort of asymptotic ADS boundary. Um, and that to some degree is why we 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 know about the duality of ADS CFG, but it's also, yeah, I I, I don't think there is an exactly the same duality to CFTs in, in asymptotically flat space or the situ or, or anything like that. Um, so ADS CFT is great for doing your calculations because you can you can make precisely defined questions. Um, but of course, you know, in the real world, uh, we think that yeah, we, 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 we ask precise questions all the time, despite the fact that our universe is, is quantum gravitational, um, because gravity is very weak, right? And so, so you know, if you have a black hole and then you have some region far away from the black hole where gravity is very weak, you can, you can in practice ignore gravity in that region and, and sort of ignore all those problems. And so all the things I said today, so the, the replica wormholes calculations for the page curve, um, the out of time order operators, the traversable wormholes, all of those things should in principle be possible to do in like, like our universe. Um, you know, that it, it's, ADS CFT is a great setting to do the calculations in because it's like it's like putting in periodic boundary conditions, right? Nobody ever builds anything on a torus, but we use periodic boundary conditions all the time. You put ADS boundary conditions on because it like you know regulates some things nicely and lets you ask questions in an easy way. Um, but like actually, no, it doesn't matter, and and we can be confident it doesn't matter. Like, like this is not like a hope it doesn't matter. It's like the the actual physics involved does not care about that. Super helpful. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Uh, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. So now I'll kindly ask the professors in the audience to leave, and we'll have another 20 minutes of questions uh, open to I everyone. I assume that doesn't include me. That does not include you, Jeff. Not yet.